Roots of the Science podcast with your girl and with an E. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Root of the Sounds podcast with your girl and with an E. As always, I'm just so thankful that you guys have decided to listen to me. If you're new here, welcome. Hopefully you stay. And if you are a listener, I ask you to please review our show. You know, the reviews really um, help in putting the show on the charts. So be it on Spotify or Apple Podcasts specifically, please review us or on Podchaser there's some really great place for you to tell us what you think about the show some things that we can improve possibly who we should invite so I will read all of those and the great thing is that we'll also get to read some of your reviews on the show sounds good review the show now let's get into today's episode my guest today is Tapiwa Nyaka Uru originally from Zimbabwe but now living and studying in Ireland In this episode, Tapiwa shares that his parents were the major motivating factor for him to get into STEM. He also tells us that his academic journey was not an easy one and he gets into detail how he overcame some of the challenges um, for him to be where he is today, a PhD student in molecular biology. He is working on a project that focuses on identification of genes in water hyacinth and water lettuce, which are plants that are responsible for the accumulation of heavy metals from water. Tapiwa tells us more about his involvement in this research and why it is so important. I discuss with him how he navigates his PhD journey, especially when things become challenging in his academic life. In particular, we discuss the implications of the pandemic to his research and how he handled all of this, especially the whole work from home transition. Tune in to hear about all of this and so much more. Let's go. Hi, Tapiwa. Welcome to the show. Hi, Anya. Thank you for inviting me. How are you? I am great. I'm so excited for us to for us to chat and for you to be part of season two. Thank you. I'm excited <laughs> to be part of this show. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I'm so excited to have you. But so let's get straight into it. Tell us a bit more about yourself. Who is Tapiwa? Um, where are you originally from, where are you currently based, and what are you currently doing? All right, so my full name is Tapiwa Nyakauru. Uh, I come from Zimbabwe, from a place called Nyanga, and I'm 27 years old. And I've done uh, a BSc degree in biochemistry, and I have a master's degree in biotechnology. And currently, I'm doing a PhD in molecular biology in Ireland at Waterford Institute of Technology. So, um, yeah, in, that's, that's, that's what I'm currently doing now. Ah, wonderful, Tapiwa. So now, before we get to know you... I'm going to play a little game with you. Okay. I'm going to play a quick little game. It's going to be a quick word association game, just so that we can kind of get to know you a little bit away from the science. So I'm going to say something, and then the first thing that pops to your mind. Are you ready? I am ready. Okay. Um, favorite pets? Give me a dog. A dog. Okay. Yeah. Um, sports or news? Give me news. News. So yeah. Pop, pop or rice? Rice. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Um, the your most annoying thing, like your pet peeve. Well, it's difficult to to mark myself, you know, to mark down myself. Uh-huh. I think the most annoying thing is sometimes I'm, if, you know, uh, I I I want to think keep I want to keep things to myself. I think that's the most annoying thing about me. Uh-huh. What's the most common word that you think you use? <laughs> Let's call it DNA. DNA. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Um, The last one. uh, Describe 2020 in three words. Well, unexpected, difficult, challenging. Yeah. Mm, Okay. Yeah. 2020 has been a year. But thank you for playing that little quick game with me. Um, We just had to... (laughs) 
<laughs> okay, so now we've we've learned uh, some little things about you that you like dogs, you like rice. That's pretty strange. I thought, for, you know, most African men are like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think um, yeah, my favorite is rice. Yes. I'm also a rice person. I'm not judging you. Like I can eat rice <laughs> all oh, yeah, day, every day. <laughs> You know, so I I totally understand that. And all right, Tafio, back to you now. Um, please um find out um about about you now. So before we get into the sciences and you being in Ireland and you doing your PhD, as we later going to get into, what actually made you do science? What was the reason behind it? Did you always know that this is something that you want to do, or is it one of those things where you know it just happened to you? Yeah, yeah, I get you. You know, for me, I think it's difficult for me to pinpoint like a single thing which made me do science. You know, I think it was a combination of different things which influenced me to to do science. I can I can tell you two or three things that um, that resulted in me doing science. The first being um, my father's brother, mm-hmm. and for the purpose of this interview, I'll call them my parents. So my parents they uh, they stay in America. So every time they used to come back now and now and again, you know, for the holidays back in Zimbabwe and. And uh, so as I was growing up, you know, and looking at them, they were like role models to us, you know, say, I would, one day I would want to be like, I would want to have a life like them to be able to explore. Mm. I didn't really know much about what they were doing, but uh, I know that they were doing something in science. All right. But again, the goal was just to do, to be like them. So I grew up in a very poor area. In the capital city of Zimbabwe, and um, in, in the society which we're growing, or in the schools which we're growing, I don't remember being asked what I want to do when I grow up. I, I I try to think about that. I don't remember anyone asking me about that. So when I was doing my primary school, I was just going to school, just like a normal kid, like like everyone. So my parents in my high school, they took me to um, a kind of a, an A school, you know, where you 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 meet uh, children from families which have got a better financial background than ours mm. so i mean it's an advantage that i was learning with people who are coming from other parts of zimbabwe but also the disadvantage was that you kind of feel like um you know low self-esteem like inferior um like just looking down upon myself to say i don't have what other kids have but then i was always trying to figure out ways in which i can get uh into other people ways in which I can blend with other students and again my main goal was to become like my parents you know they were well established and they have a good life so I wanted to be like them so the other um, thing which I found to be helpful for me to also get into this society with children who were coming from different parts of Zimbabwe was to learn those kind of difficult subjects you know so if you know for example if you know math Mm. then a lot of people would want to interact with you because you can help them solve those problems and by so doing it also helps me to be recognized in my classes or with teachers or with other people around me so I started doing math. That was my first favorite subject. I was around in Form 3 by then. And then I went on to like physics. I went on to like biology. And then I mm. stick with biology up until now. So I later on dropped, not, not necessarily dropped, but, you know, my preference is now biology. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I then started doing biology and all these subjects. And I tried very hard to to read and to understand more than everyone else, you know. And by so doing, I was just getting to blend now into the site. After finishing my high school, um, one thing which I knew I wanted now was I wanted to do something with genes. I wanted to engineer something. So I tried to do some career guidance in, you know, those universities which comes and gives career guidance at school. Yeah. Um, the, the best degree which I could get there was biotechnology. Um, but then I just applied for my my my, my, my university pro- program at University of Zimbabwe, and then I got biochemistry. I just ventured into biochemistry. I said, "Look, I will just do it." I only got to realize that this is what I really wanted when I was doing my math. Mm. And I just had to reflect back to see, oh, when I was doing my form six around 2011, I 
actually wanted to engineer genes. Now that I'm working with CRISPR Cas, now that I'm designing these primers and guide RNAs and all these things, this is actually what I wanted. To say things which have influenced me, the first thing is probably my parents because they were sort of like role models to me. But the second thing was actually low self-esteem. So for me to be able to be seen as someone in the society or as someone in the group of people whom I was associating with at, at, at the, uh, high school and secondary school, I had to do something extraordinary, you know, so I had to learn subjects which other people think they were difficult so that they could also recognize that, well, Tapua is somewhere in this class. So, um, yeah, it was quite a difficult journey yeah. to get something good out of low self-esteem. But, uh, yeah, here we are. <laughs> yeah, that's that's quite interesting. And, you know, when, when I think of low self-esteem, and I think of many others, it's something that's very crippling to a person. It actually yeah. makes a person not do a lot, you know? Yeah. And um, I love how for you, it was a positive thing. You really used it to make you better, like you said, to stand out. And you kind of took that negative and made it into a positive. That's that's absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's amazing that you're able to do that. And also you touched on the fact that you didn't quite know what you wanted to do until you were in master's. And I think with somebody who's listening and is like, in the journey and they're like oh my word i don't know what to do i think you touched on something important because i think some of us do these degrees and we do them because we have to right yeah. <laughs> and you don't quite know why you're doing what you're doing and it takes that one moment and mm-hmm. and then you're like oh this is what i'm doing what you what i'm doing right yeah it's you know um it's it's very true that when i was in my master's i had to reflect back to what i've done during that master's period in my undergrad and way back to my um my high school it's difficult to actually pinpoint to say well i i want to do this and then you focus on that we just do the degrees um because we have to you know and in biochemistry there were um in biochemistry there are a lot of uh fields you know there's mm. plant fuel there's um animal fuel there's human fuel you know immunology and all those things so if you are doing a degree which is broad like biochemistry sometimes it's also difficult for you to actually say i want to do this so yeah almost most of the people are in this same journey of doing the degree for the sake of doing it and then we'll see how it goes no after i finish i'll see how (laughs) (laughs) yeah we're just floating through we're just floating through um it's it it really it really really does happen and it's but but at least for you you finally managed to pinpoint um where you want to go. And Tapio, before we get into further in terms of your studies, right, you spoke that you grew up um, in Zimbabwe in an area where, um, in, in, a, in a low income area compared to the other people. Um, yes. So before you, you went on to do your master's, um, I know you have a very interesting story that I'd like you to share that you, you, you finished your undergrad and you, and you wanted to pursue, um, getting a job, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yes. Yeah. And then I think like many graduates, it's, it's really hard to find employment these days, right? It's, it's difficult even with a basic, uh, with a, with a, with a, B, which in the past was something really, really huge. But I think nowadays it's really difficult. And like many, um, many people, you try and look for greener pastures elsewhere. Can you please just share your story in terms of that journey? Just before I finished my, my undergraduate degree, I was talking to my friends and we were saying, we're planning of leaving Zimbabwe and going to South Africa to look for some other biochemistry jobs to do because mm. we you know everyone always says South Africa has good things so we wanted mm. to go there but I was kind of hesitant to go to South Africa so when we finished I went to Zambia with my mother because my mother has got friends in Zambia so I went to stay with my mother's friend in Zambia and I was trying to look for something to do mm. it was quite a difficult journey because 
this was a new community and I'm trying to blend in the new community. I'm trying to look for a job and uh, I've left Zimbabwe and I, I'm just in the middle of nowhere because I don't know if I'll get a job or not. So I spent much of my time uh, working in the streets of Lusaka using GPS, uh, looking for companies to drop my CVs. Um, I did quite a lot of things and then I just said that one day and I realized that, look, I might not be able to get a job in, in, in Zambia. Uh, yeah. But I must tell you that it was quite difficult for me to reach that conclusion to say, I might not get anything in Zambia. Time might be flying and I might just stay here and not getting uh, the job. And again, I didn't want to, I didn't want my 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 visa to expire in Zambia. So I had to go back home before it expires because I didn't get anything uh, in Zambia. So when I got home, um, I started looking for jobs in Zimbabwe. Uh, I looked for teaching jobs. I looked for jobs in manufacturing. I looked for jobs in laboratory in, in laboratories. And I remember one day I was sitting in my room and I was looking at my phone, just waiting for a call, you know, no more call. Maybe someone would call me and say, uh, look, we are offering you this job. And then mm. I thought to myself, what if no one calls me? What if I won't receive any call whatsoever from anyone until I die? <laughs> Am I just <laughs> going to sit down and wait for the call to come? I, I really need to do something. So prior to that moment, I had applied for a place, a teaching assistant place at the University of Zimbabwe. And it was taking time for the, for the, uh, for, for the approvals of our names and for us to get the jobs. I just said, look, I think I need to do something with my life uh, other than just waiting for a certain company to call me or a certain somebody to in, to uh, to employ me so uh, we we have got a big yard where we stay in Zimbabwe and I just looked at our yard and I said look this is a big piece of land I need to start my garden so I started my garden that very day I said look I'm going to start my garden here I'm going to grow my vegetables probably this is going to be my life forever all right so I started my garden um, and fortunately, the following day, I got a call uh, from the investor of Zimbabwe saying, we have actually are giving you this offer to do your teaching. But I must tell you that it was a, a very challenging journey for mm. someone who was so young as me just to sit down and realize that maybe I might not get a call from anyone or maybe I just, you know, just like any other graduate who's looking for a job. So it's 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 quite difficult and that I, I have a lot of people who are experiencing the same things as well to just sit down and look for jobs and trying to see where we can get employed. Um, so yeah, I've worked that gym and I tell you, it's it's quite difficult. Sounds like it. How long did you wait for your break finally to come? It was... Um, Let's just call about, I think about six, seven months. Mm. But no, so this is six, seven months off the calendar. But in my mind, it appeared like 10 years or I don't know, you know, 15 years because I'm just waking up, sleeping, waking up, sleeping, and I don't have anything tangible which I'm doing. You know? Yeah. Okay. So yes, on the calendar, it's seven months, but in my head, it's like 10 years. Mm, I can I can definitely imagine. But thankfully, um you were able to find something to do and you're just going to fast forward a little bit. And in terms of how you did it actually was that you, you, you actually got a scholarship, which is part of some of your achievements, um, which include a master's scholarship at the university of Zimbabwe. Um, and also during that time you received, um, another scholarship to study at UC Berkeley and currently you're on a PhD scholarship. So obviously after those six months, right, of where it felt like everything was, was awful, something finally clicked. I don't know, the universe, God, whichever higher power, if you believe in one, <laughs> um, you know, something actually happened. So for somebody who's listening and is also going through this thing, um, how did you do it? How, what was the secret with these scholarships? How are you getting these scholarships? If you are, let us know. <laughs> for me, uh, there was no magic in doing these things. I mean, uh, it was just... My my previous supervisor, the person who was my supervisor in my undergraduate degree, we worked together very well. So she had a master's. So she just got, she just won a grant from uh, the UC Berkeley, all right. And she had a master's project which she was offering, but she she was looking for a person who could do it, all right. And I approached her 
a number of times to say, look, can do you have any program for me to do? But I think because this was a big grant for her, she I, she didn't want to give it to someone without give, giving it a proper thought, you know, to say, do I really need to employ this person on this project? So um, uh, that day, which I was looking at my phone and I started the garden, you know, the following day, she is the one who actually sent me the message. You know, wow. Say, you, um, I might have a project for you. Do you mind coming over to the interest of Zimbabwe? I said, okay, I'll come there. I didn't have bus fare. I can, I can tell you, I didn't have bus fare, so I had to look for bus fare. Uh, two US dollars, that's what I needed. And I went to the University of Zimbabwe, and within 10 minutes into our conversation, she was already talking about me going to America, you know, on the project. Wow. And I was like, this lady is, 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 I don't know if I'm a good researcher or not, but it seems as if she is believing in me so much. So... This is actually the first scholarship which I got, all right, uh, to be able to work on this project, which was funded by UC Berkeley, all right. But now I needed to be approved at the University of Zimbabwe. And we took eight months to reject our master's by research application. Mm. Right? And they said, uh, if you want to do master's here, you have to do a taught master's and then apply for these scholarships, all right. So I... It did. I applied for the scholarships and I also applied for the taught masters, which I got, and then I got the scholarship. So I had to put my scholarship, my UC Berkeley scholarship, on hold, right? And then worked on the scholarship from the University of Zimbabwe. Then in my last semester, I think my my, sec, my two two last semesters in my master's, that's when I had to drop the University of Zimbabwe scholarship so that I could focus on the UC Berkeley scholarship. Because wow. of the conflict of interest, you know, you can't have two scholarships while someone doesn't have any scholarship you know, mm. like that. So that's when I had to drop um, the U, 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 University of Zimbabwe graduate teaching assistant scholarship and then took this UC Berkeley. So to tell you that I did something, I did a miracle to get this scholarship or I prayed or um, I was so genius enough, I'll be lying to you. It was just, <laughs> I think when I worked with my supervisor, I think we had a good uh, communication. Yeah, I think I respected him better. I think we, I showed good research skills and things like that. So she thought I was the right person to... Uh, to do to to work on the project, so um, that's how I got to go the masters in 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 the master scholarship, those two scholarships. And when I was finishing my my masters now, that was in 2019, I got shortlisted for the scholarship here in Ireland, right? And it was my first PhD interview. So they they shortlisted me, and then they gave me the date. So I prepared for the interview, and then I did the interview, right? 18 minutes of the interview. Mm. Um, after that, then the following day, I got a message from this, got a scholarship to come to Ireland to do a PhD. I was like, wow, this is, wow. Uh, so that was around May and by, by September, I was here in Ireland. So it's, it's more to do with hard work, I think. It's more to do with hard work and determination and being able to understand that everything is difficult. There's nothing which is easy. Mm. So that's how I got, that's how I got to got the scholarships and um, coming here to do my PhD in Ireland. Yeah, that's true. I think sometimes um, it, it's just the work that you put in and congratulations on on your scholarships. And also, I think, like you said, it also also helps that you had a good working relationship with your, uh, your supervisor. Obviously, that yes. came a long way. And I can also attest to that on a personal level, um, yeah, that it really, yeah. it really, really helps to have a good working relationship if you have with your supervisors because they're able to connect you to all of these amazing opportunities. And speaking of the amazing opportunity, um, you know, you're a PhD student and um, part of your research or rather your project focuses on identification of genes in water hyacinth and water lettuce that are responsible for the accumulation of heavy, heavy metals from water. So yes. um, can you please tell us how you got involved in that project, what it's all about and why is it so important? 
So, like you said, the pro- the project focuses on identifying the genes which are responsible for the removal of heavy metals from water. What we have seen recently is that um, there is rapid contamination uh, of our rivers and lakes by heavy metals because of industrialization. So we do have mines in Zimbabwe. There are a lot of mines, and in, all over the world we do have mines. People doing mining, um, or drilling, uh, and also we do agriculture and we use inorganic fat. So all the fertilizers which we the water goes to the rivers and then the lakes and everything is contaminated by heavy metal. Now there is the need that we remove heavy metals from from water if we are to use it for anything else. And currently the processes which, which are being used to remove heavy metals from water, we use uh, chemicals, you know, uh, sulfates which are used to remove contaminate heavy metal contaminants from water. But these are chemicals and they need to be removed again from the water. So um, we thought of trying to use the genes from other plants which were found to be capable of removing heavy metals to levels that are hundreds or thousands above other plants. So we do have water hyacinth and water lettuce, two plants they are responsible or they they can remove heavy metals from water. All right. So we are trying to look at the genomic level to see what which genes are actually responsible for this removal of heavy metals from water. So if we understand these genes, if we study them and we understand them, we can then be able to clone them in other plants. All right. The reason is Iconia crust space, that's the water icing, water icing and water lettuce, they are invasive species. All right? mm. So water icing is not even allowed to grow in um in Europe because it's so invasive. So even though we want to use it to clean our, our, our rivers or our dams here in Europe, we can't do that because the plant is invasive and it's not allowed to grow. So we thought of getting the genes from the plant mm-hmm. and put those genes in a plant which is user friendly and then use that plant, for example, in Europe to remove uh, heavy metals from our rivers or our lakes. So the project has got about three or four stages. The first stage being to be able to go into literature and ident and look for the found in other plants to be capable of removing the before the production of proteins which then chelates or which binds to heavy metals. All right. So what we are going to do is we are going to see if the expression of these genes uh, changes when we put the plants uh, under heavy metal exposure. All right. So we're going to get our plants and grow them in an environment which has got heavy metals and then check if the, the expression of genes, or right, if the expression of genes changes when the plants are exposed to heavy metals. If the expression changes, we hopefully hopefully want to see it increasing. If the expression increases, then it means that surely these genes are responsible for the accumulation of uh, heavy metals by this plant. Then we have to clone them, firstly in bacteria. If we clone them in bacteria, then we are going to uh, try and identify or try and see if the bacteria can accumulate heavy metals the same way as the plants were doing. If the bacteria is capable of removing heavy metals from water, then we clone the gene in in environmentally friendly hosts, all right, Mm -hmm. like microalgae. So if we clone them, if we put that gene, that same gene in microalgae, we should be able to see microalgae accumulating heavy metals from water. So instead of us to use water icing to remove heavy metals from water, we're going to use microalgae to use heavy, to remove heavy metals from water. So that's the whole idea. And it came about because of the rapid industrialization which is happening globally. If you check in China, if you check the water in China, you see that because of industrialization, there are a lot of heavy metals which are you know deposited. Mm. Like if you check um, electronic waste, you know we have cars, we have everything. So there's a lot of accumulation, and again we have climate change. So because of climate change, some heavy metals which were not found in the environment are now being found because of you know maybe acid rain or yeah. changes in temperature or things like that. So we are just trying to. To, to design a method in, in, in order for us to be able to uh, to remove the heavy metals from water or to encounter the problem before it it, it it becomes too late. Most interesting thing for me is is that I am doing something to do with engineering genes. That's mm. what I always wanted to do. So it's, it's, it's interesting to me because in the uh, in the process of trying to solve the global problem, mm. I'm also doing what I want. You know. 
it definitely sounds exciting and I can just hear the excitement in your voice and when you talk about it it's you're really excited about your work and I think that's the best part doing something that you love but you mentioned that the project has got different parts right different stages and even even when you explained it I could kind of sense the different stages so which stage are you currently um, on right now <laughs> You know, it's you know when you're doing a PhD, it's 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 sometimes it's so difficult to pinpoint which stage you are on because yeah. it's back and forth. It's back and forth. You go forward, you come backwards. But I've successfully managed to design the primers which can uh, amplify those genes which I need. All right, and I I didn't also mention that these plants which I'm talking about they are not. Uh, they, are, they are really studied at genomic level. You know, we don't have much of genes from um, in, from like NCBI database. So it was a challenge again for me to actually uh, get the genes from the plants because I didn't have the sequence to use to design my primers to use for PCR in the first place. So we have managed to uh, sequence to we have managed to sequence five new. Uh, metallothion and going to publish on NCBI. Um, we've managed to be um, expressed when we expose our plants to heavy metals. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've managed to get a couple of co- collaborations and a number of, pl- and again, uh, to obtain the plants from uh, different, from botanical gardens and other different stakeholders. So it's, it's roughly around stage two now, which we have just, uh, which we've just begun. But again, it's back and forth because I need to repeat some of the experiments with a different enzyme to be able to confirm my results, to be able to confirm my sequences before I put them on NCBI or before I write the paper on them. But I can tell you that we have six new sequences which are not yet on NCBI, which is a very huge discovery for me mm. and my supervisor team to say we've actually put these six new sequences on our database, NCBI database. So yeah, I'm kind of excited, but it's back and forth around stage one to stage two, somewhere there. That's where I'm 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 progressing. Wow, congratulations on your discovery. That's huge. That's huge. Yeah, but- you, Tapiwa. You did that. <laughs> yeah. so when, when, when I have my meetings with my supervisor, I keep on saying, so we did this experiment, we did this experiment. And my supervisor told me, no, it's not we, it's you. It's actually you. You did this experiment. We only helped you to do it. So I'm kind of excited to see how it goes, to see how I, I can't wait for the day to see my sequences online with other people using the information or yeah. the publication or something like that. That sounds super exciting and uh, I can't, I, I am excited on your behalf and also just Thank you. in terms of the research that you're doing, like you said, it's got so much real life application and I think that's the best part where you can see that even after you've done and the work that you do, um, somebody else can replicate it or rather try and modify it to fit their um, their environment. So congratulations on the work that you do and all of the exciting discoveries that you've made. Um, that's, that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Just now, um, as much as a PhD, like you, you did mention that with a PhD, there's a back and forth. There's times where we even spoke about this um, off air, <laughs> that <laughs> there are times where you feel like you know what you're doing and there are times where you have no idea what you're doing. And I yeah. suppose that's that's part of the process of the whole PhD journey, right? Yeah, so yeah, um, <laughs> with that being said, Tapio, I just wanted to to ask you that on those on those hard days, because you know they are there and they, they are a lot, um, when things become, you know, challenging, in particular in your academic life, where is that internal space or place where you go to, to kind of steady yourself, to kind of put you back on track? Oh, what I've seen over the couple of years, I mean, doing my experiments here in Ireland and back in Zimbabwe, I think the first stage for me, what I do is I accept that it's difficult. You know, it's 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 something which I've seen to be helpful for me to accept that if you are doing not even a PhD, even a master's or even an undergrad, 
just to accept that this is difficult, you know, it saves you a lot of hassle to try and argue with yourself to think maybe you're not good enough or maybe you're not you know, capable of doing this project. So my first part of call is to accept that this is difficult. So even if I sit down to write an email, I told myself that writing an email in a constructive way, trying to prove a point to someone or to say something, it's not easy, right? So it's difficult. So that's my starting point. Uh, but again, if I face more challenges, um, of course, I do have some personal times which I sit down and reflect on what I've done. I mm. think, uh, you know, just to, to, make, to make me think that, you know, I'm not a failure, you know. If, if an experiment is failing, it doesn't mean that it's me who's failing. Or it's just an experiment. It's not me. So, yeah, I kind of sit down and think through it. But the other thing which I've also seen to, to be more helpful is that I call my friends, all right. So I, I also have a couple of friends who are doing PhDs. So we usually talk well, almost every Friday, right? We have mm-hmm. a video call almost every Friday, and then we discuss our projects. I don't really know what they're doing. They don't really know what I'm doing, but we all face the same challenges of a PhD, of not getting results, of you know, troubleshooting, or of reading, or of maybe designing a certain method. So if we talk, and I get to hear other people's sides, you know, I also see that it's not only me in this whole situation of, you know, having difficulties with my studies. We actually, there are actually a lot of people, you know, who are involved. And that makes me kind of accepting that, well, it's normal to fail. It's normal to not have uh, good days every day. The other thing which also helps me is if I talk to my supervisors. So my supervisors, they kind of um, increase my how was the word my confidence um yeah something like that because mm-hmm. when i talk to them they tell me that you're doing really great you're doing good so that hearing that from them you know it really helps me to to soldier through but again my start my starting point is to accept that it's not easy at all yeah definitely i think you touched on so many amazing parts of that acceptance thing and i think sometimes when you are really good or when you think you should be good in particular because everybody's got that notion tells you that oh my word you're a phd student so apparently you are good you are really good right so accepting those failures is really hard especially to sit with those failures yeah to be like you know what i actually failed and um for you to acknowledge that it it's so much easier said than done you know those it's, feelings it's, it's, yeah it's, <laughs> it's easier to say it than to actually do it to say well i failed I, I, this is difficult for me. I, um, it's, it's, it's quite difficult to actually prove it, you know. Mm. And also because I think sometimes if you think you've failed or it's, you acknowledge that it's difficult, it kind of derails you a little bit more. Like, because you have a plan, you know, like let's think yeah. about it in terms of um, a PhD in your proposal, you have to do your research plan, right? So you say yeah, in yeah. three months... I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, and then in the next three months or the next, and then case on point COVID, um, that nobody saw coming, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. It derailed so many people's plans because we are, we get taught we need to have a plan for our research because it's three, four years and yeah. you need to be gone because there's a scholarship, right? So you need to do things in time. So now yeah. when these things fail and it derails your whole plan, it, it's hard, it, right? It's, it's, yeah, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. I, I feel you. So no, yeah. we face it. We yeah. all face it. <laughs> Definitely. And um, just to bring in COVID and what you said when I asked you those three things about t- describing um, COVID, um, 2020 in three words, you did say it was yeah. challenging, etc. How did it? How did COVID implicate um, implicate your research study? Did it stop it, or and how did you manage? So when COVID, I was just about to. Well, I done it. So I had a meeting on the 11th of March, and then we went on lockdown on the 13th of March. I wanted to do more on the sequences because maybe by now I could have published the sequences or maybe move to stage two or stage three of my research. 
So when COVID started, it kind of stopped much of my lab work. All right. So when COVID started, I switched on to go back to my literature review to say I need to do more in literature review in this COVID time. All right. But the most difficult thing in COVID was actually working from home. I mean, for me, working from home was quite difficult uh, in the sense that I needed to prove to myself that I'm working. You know, it's difficult if you go to, it's different if you go to the lab, you go there, are uh, pipettes, there are beakers, and then you do an experiment. And then after that, you come back home. But if you are at home, then you're just seated and mm. you're you and you're doing it every day for two months, for three months. You know, you sometimes you feel like you are not doing enough. Sometimes you feel like you're not working properly. So that's one of the things which I faced during uh, during the COVID. But I try to do more on my literature review and on my planning, and my methodology, and then analysis of some of my results which I had. It was quite difficult to not to know when I'll be, when I'll go back to the lab. But um, yeah, here we are. But it's it's not it's not easy in 2010. I mean, and on on the social part of these things. I am here in Ireland, all right, very far from my family. Mm. And then we're just put in lockdown and I don't know how they're doing. They don't know how I'm doing or rather we don't know when we are going to see each other again. It's, it's something which was not really good uh, for me not to know when I'll see my family again. And I'm just staying here alone and I don't know if my funding will be paused or not. It's difficult. <laughs> it's like suspended somewhere, you know, so... It was quite difficult, yeah. Oh, no, I, I completely get it. It's been a year. It's been a year. But we are just grateful that things are able to start again. And even with you and your research, you're able to do this fantastic work that you do. And hopefully sooner, soon you'll be able to see your family. I know with international students, that's always the hardest part, being away from yeah, home. It's, it's- it's, it's always satisfied. but we we get used to it i mean i have i have i have moments where i think at home but i have moments where i don't think at home <laughs> mm. well um, yeah that's great um so people, just to wrap it up in on a happier note you know you've taught us you've told us some really amazing things we've learned about your research and you taught us about persevering a lot and not giving up I just want you to give us some final nugget in terms of what would you say to somebody who aspires to get into the field or who is interested in what you do um, and the work that you do? What little advice would you be, would you be able to give? I think if I'm to give someone an advice, uh, considering what I'm doing or considering STEM, I think my, my, my first point is to explain to the person that when you are learning things from maybe masters or maybe undergrad you are not learning those things to pass you are learning those things to know them all right so i've seen it uh i have a couple of friends or people whom i know who just you know if you're in the lab they do it for the sake of pleasing the supervisors for example or just passing and forgetting so if you want to be a researcher if you want to be in stem or in any other field i think you need to invest more in yourself i think you need to make sure that your skills are at par make sure that you work so hard to get skills which you need to get all right um at conferences at seminars you know writing proposals on your own and just train yourself to do these things or to think critically because mm. I've seen that a lot of people want to apply for scholarships. They want to get a scholarship and then come to Europe or to America, which is fine. And I completely agree. But you need to remember that scholarship is money coming from someone's pocket. All right. And the person doesn't give away money just like he's, he's getting it from someone. Um, when they are giving you a scholarship, they are believing in you. They are actually saying, maybe you can do this thing. So if you get a scholarship, if you are in Malawi or in Zimbabwe, and then you get a scholarship to come to UK or to Netherlands or any other country, mm. when you arrive there, you need to prove that you worth the scholarship. You know, this is something which a lot of people don't think about. You know, if you get, they say if you get a scholarship, you are, I'm, I'm a genius or I'm intelligent. But when you arrive to the institution, you need to prove that you are actually worth the scholarship. All right. So invest more in yourself before getting a scholarship. Invest more in yourself before starting to try to venture into research. Just have you know, the, that curiosity mind to say, I would need to do this. So if I need to do this, I need to make collaborations. I need to know how to network. I need to know how to go to the conferences or to, to increase my skills and, you know, and things like that. 
So I think, yeah, but that's, that's, I think that's my take home message to say invest in yourself and know that if you get a scholarship or if you are to work on a certain project which is funded by someone, Mm. You to prove that you're worth it. It's, it's not just getting a scholarship and then you know you, you don't do anything else. You actually need to prove that you you're worth it. Thank you, Sophia, for that. That's that's some solid advice. Yeah, I think so. I think one tends to forget when the money comes that hey, actually <laughs> I have to work for it. <laughs> you know, when the funding comes, you t- you people sometimes tend to forget <laughs> <laughs> that you actually have to do the work. And I think yeah. investing in yourself is is definitely key to just be a better person. And you and you learn more. The more you learn, yeah. um, the the better researcher. Like you said, you can be, and the and the better quality work that you can produce. So I think it's something good to learn quickly. Um, and thank you for that for that for that important note. And uh, no hopefully worries. somebody took <laughs> took yeah, some I, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but with that being said, Tapio, thank you so much for chatting with me. I had a really good time getting to know you for you teaching us a little bit about what you do it was so lovely having you thank you so much Anna with an E for inviting (laughs) me to this wonderful show Uh, thank you so much and to everybody else who's listening thank you once again for tuning in to another episode of the Root of the Science podcast with your girl Anna with an E until next time goodbye